had a withered arm, webbed toes, a pockmarked face, and grew up hating. He seized control of one of the world's largest nations and murdered 40 million of its inhabitants. Even after death, he dominated the lives of his countrymen. Not until August 1991 did a determined Soviet people rise up and exorcise his malignant influence. of this man were the bloodiest in history. The man himself was the monstrous and inevitable product of the Communist Party and State, founded in Russia in 1917 on the principle that the end justifies the means. Pitiless, cunning, and cynical, he mocked the value of human life, proclaiming that when one person dies, it is a tragedy, but when a million die, it is a statistic. Never has one man held such absolute power over so many and used it with such extravagant brutality as Joseph Vissarionovich Jugashvili, the monster who named himself Stalin. St. Petersburg, the cradle of Russia's 1917 revolution. Here, in a coup against the legitimate government, the Bolsheviks seize power. Led by Vladimir Lenin, they ignite a civil war that brings immense suffering and violent death to millions. Death itself becomes a triviality. country lies in ruins. Cities are rubble heaps ruled by rats and hunger. Only the military seem at home here. Millions of peasants flee their homes and live rough. Starving, they wander the countryside in search of food. The peasants, whose harvest has been seized by the contending armies, now cannot feed themselves. In 1921, a great famine sweeps the land. Despite government efforts, thousands die daily of starvation. The children suffer most. Their bodies, denied food, turn inward and consume themselves. Abandoned, there is no one to comfort them or mark their graves. Relief workers do their best, but more than five million people starve to death in the 12 months that follow. Entire regions are emptied of life in what seems an almost biblical apocalypse. Regardless, the Bolsheviks continue to scour the land for anything edible. Lenin names his genocidal policy war communism. Enter young Joseph Stalin, who is given carte blanche to seize and distribute food in the south. Stalin, with his hungry army, is headquartered in Zaritsyn on the Volga. In choosing Stalin for this job, Lenin is doubtless influenced by Stalin's reputation as a ruthless enforcer. Anton Antonov Ovsienko, historian and son of a famous Bolshevik, spent 13 years in Stalin's prisons. 
It was an abuse of power. Stalin behaved like a dictator watching out for himself and his troops instead of shipping food to Moscow and Petrograd, which were starving. For example, a single one of his divisions with 4,600 men was given rations for 20,000 while the rest of Russia starved. It was the behavior of a dictator. Meanwhile, he ignored Lenin's urgent cables demanding that food supplies be shipped north. He ignored it all and kept the largest part of the provisions for his own troops, far more than needed. But the farmers strike back at the predatory Bolsheviks with such violence that in the next two years, 1,800 revolts erupt. The rebellion wasn't confined to isolated towns and cities. It became general throughout a considerable part of Russia and the Ukraine. The most formidable of those revolts broke out in the city of Tambov. It began in the summer of 1921. To crush it, the Bolsheviks imposed a reign of terror throughout the Tambov region. Whole villages were destroyed. I'm ashamed to say that my father's name, Antonov of Seyenko, is connected with it. He was head of the Extraordinary Commission. At Tambov, many are the dead, and many the mourners. The nation is shocked. Lenin is thwarted. It forces him to rethink his new economic policy. Until now, all of the farmer's grain had been confiscated. Lenin's new plan allows them to keep 70% and sell it on the open market. Their own masters again, the farmers go back to work with a will. Many party leaders oppose Lenin's plan, calling it a betrayal of communism. But Stalin stands by his patron, Lenin. Stalin's toadying to Lenin has already earned him the strategic post of party general secretary. In less than two years, the economy is booming. Formerly empty stores do a brisk business in products almost forgotten by consumers. Happy days are here again. State-of-the-art agricultural equipment flows into the rural areas as farmer co-ops exchange their harvests for foreign-made goods. Newly imported cattle breeds come on the market. Frisians from Germany and other breeds from France and England. A prosperity spiral is set in motion as farmers trade up to the new technology and with it speedily increase their yields and their personal worth. Never has the Russian farmer enjoyed such good times. Lenin dies, and Stalin capitalizes on growing friction in the party over Lenin's new plan. It results in party propaganda films, which picture the newly prosperous farmers as decadent petit bourgeois and sex-crazed hedonists, a fungus attacking the thrifty and virtuous proletariat, one that must be expunged. A belligerent Stalin addresses a closed party session in October 1925. He declares war on Russia's farmers. It is foolish to think the civil war has ended. It has not, Stalin proclaims. We must create another revolution, a revolution from above. Confusion smites the party leaders. 
What does he mean? We should attack the source of our wealth? But no word of this reaches the farmers. Their yield increases. The economy flourishes. And the farmers continue to bring their grain to the docks for shipment abroad. Grain, as the Soviet Union's principal export, is also its chief source of hard currency. Thanks to its farmers, Russia is able to buy the machinery needed for rapid industrialization. And for the first time in living memory, enjoys a respectable economy. Whimsically, the success of communism now depends on capitalism. In 1927, to increase government cash flow, Stalin fiddles with grain prices and raises taxes. It doesn't work. The farmers balk and refuse to sell their grain. Now Stalin sets off on a whistle-stop campaign through the farming areas of the Soviet Union, beginning with Siberia. At each town and village, he lashes out at the newly prosperous farmers, the so-called kulaks, denouncing them as enemies of the people and demanding their arrest as criminals for hoarding grain while millions of their countrymen starve. The kulaks are traditional enemies of central authority. The Tsars have preyed on them for centuries, and now, Stalin. Returning to Moscow, Stalin escalates his revolution from above. We must not place our industry at the mercy of kulak caprices. We must make sure that state-operated farms provide a third of our yield. Stalin's plan is to provoke an upheaval in the villages that will rip to shreds the fabric of rural Soviet life and deliver the kulaks up for slavery. He redefines the word kulak to include all but the poorest of the poor. Frightened and confused, the kulaks pass the word among themselves to assemble in Moscow and request a hearing. They pour in from all corners of the vast Soviet Union and get their hearing, upon which Stalin declares them capitalists and enemies of the people. But they tell each other, we are the people. Stalin's offensive is underway. And now he displays his mastery of the political arts, beginning with the setup. In the village of Ludorvai, these kulaks had sentenced certain village layabouts to a flogging. Stalin seizes the moment. He orders an exhibition trial to be staged and the media to paint a lurid picture of kulaks grinding the faces of the poor. The wretched kulaks get 10 years. Their farms are confiscated. It is an ominous precedent. Now Stalin, pleased with his phony trial, orders an all-out media assault. Kulaks are the stronghold of counter-revolution. Rise up in arms against the Kulaks. Liquidate the Kulak class. Use your fist against the Kulak fist. Battalions of Stalin's secret police, the OGPU, are now phased into the assault, and the work begins. Thousands of Kulak families are rousted from their homes. Their land, grain, implements, and livestock plundered. The scavengers miss nothing. Every last kernel is gleaned and carted off. In the search for contraband, every home is ransacked.
This woman, terrified of the OGPU and painfully aware of the camera, has concealed grain. It will go hard with her man. He will be marched off to prison or stood against a convenient wall. Meanwhile, the poorest of the poor are recruited as informers. Rouse the poor for the fight against Kulaks. We don't need Kulaks and their farms. As his press clamors for blood, Stalin reveals his next move, banishment. In the Ukraine alone, 33,000 Kulak families are evicted and transported to far-off labor camps. Under the cold eye of the secret police, they are taken to the nearest railway and loaded into cattle cars. It is freezing and the cars are unheated. There is no food, no water. It is a catastrophic event. The tragic end for an entire people and their centuries old way of life. Desperate mothers wrap their babies in their own coats and throw them from the train with a note, hoping some kind Samaritan will find them. Stalin again turns up the heat. He sets out to collectivize all farming, by deadly force where necessary. Russia's farms will become state-owned communes, and the Kulaks will work them under the lash. Factory workers, 25,000 of them, are enlisted as enforcers. They're given a pistol and a crash course in the forcible collectivization of farms. Stalin's mouthpiece, Lazar Kaganovich, exhorts these so-called 25,000ers, setting their goal at 100% collectivization. How to fight against Kulak oppression. How to make a hen lay 200 eggs a year. Armed with pamphlets and pistols, burning with socialist idealism, spurred on by slogans, the 25,000ers are sent off like heroes to war, which indeed it would become. Even the engine of their train urges them to take agriculture by storm. Nobel Prize winner Mikhail Sholokhov pictures the role of the 25,000er in his novel Virgin Soil Upturned. These scenes are from the film based on that novel. Ah, 25,000er. So, Makar, you're here for the collective farm case. I'm pursuing the party line policy. Kulaks must be liquidated as a class. Tit Borodin joined the partisans. Honor to him for that. But in becoming a Kulak, he has turned out an enemy. Crush him for that. No question about it. Who's for Borodin being de -kulakized? Write it. Write it. At the point of a gun, I'll write whatever you say. As a young man, Fyodor Smirnov lived through collectivization. So a 25,000er came to our village of Barantsevo dressed out in a leather jacket with a revolver on a shoulder belt. And all the farmers were gathered together and it was stated that on the order of Stalin, all of them should be recruited to the collective farms. We were against collectivization. At that time of the new economic policy, 
We lived well in the village. All the farmers refused. Well, the chairman of the village council came to father and said, you, Peter, you have much cattle. You have to give me your bull. And father says, but I'm not selling my bull. And the chairman says, you'll give it to me for nothing. Father was a simple man. He showed him his fist in a joke. The next day they told my father that all the farmers who would not join the collective will have everything taken away from them. And you are a well-off farmer, and as a kulak, you're going to be dekulakized. So we are taking away everything you own. And they drove us all out of the house, all seven of us, with nothing. The homes of the evicted kulaks are thrown open for the informers to loot. It is a drama as old as time, for guiding the leopard to his prey, the jackal gets the scraps. The leopards are rewarded as well, for his efforts on behalf of collectivization, Soviet President Mikhail Kalinin gets a medal from Stalin. Kalinin, once a farmer himself, accepts the medal in secret to avoid being seen as a traitor to his class. For the remaining farmers, anything is preferable to what they have witnessed. Many volunteer for the collectives, surrendering cattle and implements home and land to the state. Stalin himself conceives the scheme of subsidizing collective startup costs with the worldly goods of new members. Stalin takes pains to vaccinate the next generation of farmers with communist zeal. Soviet teenagers are taught in school to place state loyalty above family ties, as did Pavlik Morozov. Pavlik Morozov, a 13-year-old, broke faith with his family and betrayed his father to the secret police for having Kulak sympathies. He was killed by his outraged relatives. His deed was made a shining example to communist youth. Stalin's propaganda films paint a noble picture of the mission of the exiled farmers. They are living in Siberia, helping to build socialism. What they are really building are camps, which will ultimately make up the vast prison system known as the Gulags. Barak's life is civilized and orderly, says the propaganda film. There is congenial cohabitation and creative play for children with ample time for relaxation. In Barracks 39, the young learn new skills. In Barracks 61, the political officer leads group discussion on the merits of socialism and after dinner, there is musical entertainment. A Russian joke tells of a gulag prisoner who writes his wife a long letter praising the extravagant delights of camp life. He signs it, Love, Yuri. P.S. They shot Boris yesterday. For complaining. In 
spite of all, gulag babies are born, many of them soon to be orphaned. Stalin calls 1929 the great turning point, the year he broke the will of the farmers. He sets new quotas for gulag arrests. Officially, 5%. Unofficially, 20%. And his eager 25,000ers get the message. Making good on Stalin's nudge nudge, wink wink quota. In the course of collectivization, 12 million kulaks, men, women, and children, will be fed to the gulag meat grinder. The farmers, in an agony of desperation, burn their homes and slaughter their cattle, rather than surrender them to the collectives. In 1929 and 30, Russian farmers destroy a quarter of the nation's livestock and stage 2,000 bloody revolts. This, for the brooding Stalin, is his winter of discontent. His patriarchal image as the nation's kindly, thoughtful father, so fastidiously maintained, is fraying at the seams to reveal the snorting demon within. He must find scapegoats and blame them. Stalin Stalin tried to avoid responsibility. In March 1930, he wrote a demagogic article, Dizzy with Success, reprimanding the field agents for excessive zeal. No blame for Stalin. The Kremlin dictator pretended to a humane posture, allowing some return to the principle of voluntary participation. So Stalin found a way to shift the blame. But it was too late. Over one million farm families lost their livelihood and were deported, most of them to Siberia. While rural officials try to rationalize the new policy to the suspicious and jittery farmers, eight million Kulak families walk out of the collectives. But Stalin again shifts his ground. A revocation appears in Pravda. It seems that the voluntary principle was an expedient, not a policy change. The farmers now understand too well. They have lost. Thousands flee to the cities Anything is better than the animal existence of the collectives. But the cities close their doors. A secret Stalin order denies employment to ex-farmers. They hide in the anonymous crowds, but are hunted down. Today, some of their identities have been published. They came from all over the Soviet Union but had one thing in common. All were executed in Moscow and secretly buried there. Nikolai Grashoven, KGB head of rehabilitation. With the beginning of decolocization, floods of ex-farmers streamed into Moscow. That's why, naturally, in the early 30s, there were so many people there who were formerly engaged in agriculture. At the same time, industrial construction developed in many cities, including Moscow. Because of this, there were a great many farmers looking for these building jobs. After the revolution and civil war, a lot of farmers had already settled in towns and cities, which explains why the majority of people there were peasants. Most of the decolocized farmers who managed to escape from their places of exile 
tried to get any job they could in order to be near their families. And the very fact of being decolonized was irrefutable proof of being a counter-revolutionary. Here are some of those farmer faces, perhaps moments before execution. Terrified, but defiant. Stalin tightens his stranglehold on the Kulaks, using the party, the secret police, even the Red Army. He declares 1932 the year of total collectivization. By December, 20 million farm families will be forced into the collectives. This summer, the fields produce a good crop, but the damage is done. Bitter and resentful, the farmers drag their feet, and the crop is poorly harvested. Stalin, meanwhile, is taking an ever larger share of the dwindling yield and exporting it for foreign credits. As their portion shrinks, farmer apathy grows. Now, in a master stroke of cynicism, Stalin achieves two ends with a single move. He will increase his export yield, and in doing so, will teach Soviet farmers a lesson they will never forget. He will manufacture a famine. His secret police pry into every corner of the Soviet Union for grain, taking even the seed for next summer's crop. Russia's farmlands become wastelands. There is nothing left to eat but birds, berries, insects, and one another. As the famine grips, so does panic. And those who can flee in search of food. But Stalin traps the rest. He throws cordons of troops around the famine regions and starves the farm families to death, deliberately, methodically, and effectively. In this Ukrainian village, in one of the world's richest farming areas, lives Daria Stepanova. Of her family, she alone survived the famine. They took away everything we owed. First, our cow, which died because no one looked after it. Then they took away all the grain. We had only our log cabin, our izba, left for my mother, me and two sisters. We didn't know what to do. We couldn't even cry. We had nothing to eat and mother began to swell from hunger. When spring came, I gathered some nettles and wheat and boiled them to use for food for my sisters and mother. One day, I was washing linen and my seven-year-old sister, Anushka, came up and said, Dasha, I'm going to drown myself. Without even looking up, I said, so drown yourself. I couldn't imagine she was serious. All of a sudden, she jumped into the river and sank. We had no strength to carry her to the cemetery. When I brought bread for the first time, my mother and sister began to cry. Give it to me, give it to me. But there was so little bread that I couldn't do it. There was such hunger in our village that finally cannibalism developed there. Some of the women Bondar Pelageya, Odyska Yakimchuk, and Tatiana Kashuk killed and ate up their own children. People dug up corpses and ate them. On Whit Sunday of 1932, my little sister Marinka began to die. 
She was only six years old and she was dying for three days. She cried constantly, begging us for something to eat. Then mother died. Of my relatives, 16 people died all in all. I didn't know how many died in our village until 1971 when I went back to visit. I met a former activist collective farmer, Alexander Pendeleya, who told me that apart from those who had left the village or been exiled, 1,540 villagers died of hunger. of famine, Stalin's propaganda films show only happy farmers. When rumors leak, Stalin invites influential guests to inspect. Here, George Bernard Shaw and Lady Astor, then skillfully orchestrates their visits to the famine-stricken regions. Shaw and Lady Astor are expertly conned. Their visit has been carefully rehearsed. And most of the happy farmers are cast from the ranks of Stalin's secret police. Back in England, Shaw exclaims, famine, certainly not. The food was excellent. I'll tell you a story that shows Stalin's real attitude towards farmers. I heard this from Ivan Mihailovich Groinsky, who was the editor of Izvestia and a close friend of Stalin's. They were so close that Stalin gave him his home number in the Kremlin. Not many party people had that Kremlin number. In the terrible year of 1933, Gronsky was traveling with Stalin by train. They were crossing through the area where farmers were dying of starvation, and Gronsky summoned up the courage to say, you know, Josef Vissarionovich, our farmers are dying here, millions of them. Let them die, Stalin replied. They're just trying to sabotage us. For Stalin, the farmers were nothing but dirt. Millions of deaths later, Stalin has won his war against the Soviet farmers. They are now harnessed to the collectives. The once fierce and independent farmers, Russia's last holdouts against communism, now drill meekly by the numbers. They labor by the numbers. Their work is assigned in job lots. Government bureaucracy takes charge of their lives. Inspectors, nearly as numerous as workers, scrutinize every move. And finally, the day's labor. The results are recorded for points, not payment. Lunch. In this propaganda film, every meal is a picnic. My, how delicious. Yes, isn't it? For children, there is regimented play. For their parents, the obligatory political sermon. And the automated response. Stalin, at the height of the famine, issues a cruel order, the Five Storks Law. It prescribes death by firing squad, or 10 years imprisonment, for stealing so little as five stalks of grain. In the first year, 50,000 are arrested, 2,000 executed. 
on a wintry day in Moscow, a parade is staged to celebrate the success of collectivization. The farmers are exhibited like Roman captives. A triumphant Stalin basks in his achievement. But his achievement would prove catastrophic. The most crippling blow ever struck at communism. For the Soviet Union would never recoup its former ability to put bread in the mouths of its people. And 60 years later, Stalin's achievement would become the undoing of his communist empire. Yet in defiance of reason, he remains a god to many. At this agricultural meeting, Stalin leads his own applause. The farmers, who have met their master, salute him. Historians believe that Stalin's motive for collectivizing was not entirely what it seemed. As the arch-bureaucrat, Stalin may have reasoned wrongly that collectivization would bring with it certain efficiencies. But most likely, the motive within the motive was fear. Stalin's fear that traditional Russian farming, with its fierce independence of thought and action, would one day threaten his omnipotence and therefore his most cherished ambition, historical greatness. His revolution from above would be seen as a revolution nobler even than Lenin's. And history would enshrine him among the greatest leaders of all time. A modern Caesar. Colossal in his grandeur. On a collective farm in northern Russia, Alexandra Pikareva lived and worked her entire life. We were a family of six. Three children, father and brother, and mother. Oh, my mother died in the collectivization. Then my father died, and we were left alone, orphans. For 60 years of work, I have awards and commendations. That's all I have left. No money, nothing. So what? I live alone. I asked to live in the home for the aged. But when I went there and I saw it, oh, it was really horrible. No, I couldn't do it. I went away. Now I don't know where I'm going to end my days. Now I can barely walk. God is my last hope. Years later, Stalin admits to Winston Churchill that 10 million farmers died in the collectivization. The actual number is 20 million by starvation, execution, and death. 
in the camps.